Prime Minister, why did the government go outside Mauritius to find somebody to organize the independence celebrations? First of all, because he's the most efficient man who sets your word. And uh, he has had experience of it in several countries. And I'm sure he has done so well elsewhere that I was satisfied he would be a great help to my country if we were to invite him. <coughs> This there, you see again. It catches on that hook. Can you get a hacksaw? Throw it off. About nine o'clock tomorrow morning, my morning. friend. Oui? Yeah. Bon. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We'll try it again tomorrow. Colonel Eric Hefford, CBE, DSO, 54 years old, has one of the most singular jobs in the world. He organizes independence celebrations. This one in Mauritius is his eighth, perhaps his last. Nations ripe for independence are a dwindling commodity. Distinguished Order of St. Michael and St. George, Officer of the Civil Division of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, and Her Excellency Lady Rennie. The Governor, his Lady, and his aides are the strongest continuing link with 150 years of British rule. Now, while Mauritius enters the troubled phase of riots and disorders, which always seem to accompany independence, the ceremonial man rehearses them in their last formal roles, using the time-honoured abbreviations beloved of all civil servants everywhere. Be and CJ rises, please, and bows. H <coughs> moves to the table. John rises, everybody rises. And then um, you take the two oaths, Sir John, the oath of allegiance and the um, official oath. Sir John, you sit down, and CJ, you bow again to H.G. and resume your place. That's it. You are the yeah, you sit down to the yes, and a short pause, and then Sir John rises and makes a speech. Yes, can I make my speech? That's it, you made a speech, thank you very much, and sit down. How do you actually go about organising an independence celebration? Well, there are certain basic things. Uh, first of all, is an independence day, and on that day, obviously, you've got to have a state opening of parliament at which the royal visitor, whoever he or she may be, um, hands the constitutional instruments to the Prime Minister. And this is a constitutional thing, so it must be done in Parliament. And it's also, they are rather, the sort of legal documents saying, well, now you're independent. And so, that being so, <clears throat> uh, we like to raise the flag at midnight on the night before, because this is the moment in time when the country becomes independent, a midnight ceremony. Well, now, just to raise a flag at midnight doesn't mean very much, and to get a lot of people there to see it, for two or three minutes isn't worthwhile. So there has to be a build-up before this. And what I like to do is to lay on a sort of something on the lines of a military tattoo in the old-fashioned way, but I call it a national display. And I try and get um, the local talent um, to perform and do their stuff. But it's normally based on sort of police and any army who may be about, uh, police motorcyclists, trick riding and um, local national dances and all this sort of business so that we get a performance of about an hour before the actual flag raising itself. And then immediately after the flag raising, I like to give a big firework display, all in the same place. And this, I think, sort of expresses emotionally the feelings of the people at that moment that they've become independent. Uh, this is what I like to think, anyway, and in most countries it works. Do you always get the cooperation that you want? I always get full cooperation. Uh, the ability, though, and uh, the incentive to work hard differs sometimes. <laughs> from one country to another. And in some countries, uh, uh, they don't like the idea of sort of working until 11 or midnight. How but, have you got on here? Um, well, here, they're not, um, they're not awfully hard workers, although they're most charming people. Uh, for instance, Saturdays and Sundays are non-working days, officially. I've been here for 81 days, and out of those 81 days, 31 days have either been Saturdays or Sundays, or Hindu holidays, or Muslim holidays, or Chinese New Year's, or three days off because the cyclone couldn't make up his mind whether to come here or not. And then, of course, the riots when everybody, we lost five days because people were too frightened to come to work. So, in fact, out of 81 days, 31 have been lost. 
As far as cost is concerned, you, you said that you had a rather limited budget. Uh, how does this work out? Well, it varies considerably. You see, in Nigeria, where the late Prime Minister, who was a very great man, in my opinion, um, they simply said to me, what did it cost in Ghana? I had nothing to do with Ghana's celebrations, but I knew. And I said, one and a quarter million. Well, he said, ours have got to be twice as good, so you'll want two and a half million. Um, well, that's one extreme. The other extreme is an island like Malta, um, where we did it for 130,000 pounds. But the average is 250 to 300,000 pounds. What about here? Well, here will be even less than Malta. Um, we're budgeting on about one and a quarter million rupees, and a rupee is one and sixpence. Cut price independence, almost? Uh, yes, it is, yes. It, it's a cut price job in many ways. We've cut out a lot of the frills and things that I would like to do, uh, purely on the grounds of economy. They're not necessary, but they all add to the general gaiety and jollification. Another rehearsal. To preside over the gaiety and jollification on the day, Mauritius is allocated two of the Royal Second Eleven, Princess Alexandra and Mr. Angus Ogilvy. Clark, the door, quick, quick, quick. Naturally, royalty rehearses in private, so to fill in, Colonel Hefford has got himself a pair of understudies, a lady police sergeant and a rather awed constable. To receive them, a real live banqueting manager and a host of waiters whose only language is Creole French and whose fingernails are considered to be suspect. The celebrations are to include a state banquet to be held in this girls' school hall because none of the island's hotels are big enough. And the waiters, cream of a dozen different establishments, must be drilled through an interpreter to put the right plates in the right places, the right wine in the right glasses, and of course, keep their fingernails clean. Right, Clement, I think we'd better start off with a little plate drill. I'll tell you what I think we should do, and then you'll pass it on in your best creole. Yes. Right? What exactly are you doing here, Colonel? I am here purely to um, see what effect the, the blast from these helicopters will have on the public on the, on the day itself. We'll be standing where and where I am. If the blast is too big and the noise is too big, they may become frightened. They may, children may get frightened, they might start to run, there might be a stampede, people might be hurt. I don't want that to happen. As you see, the choppers have now come down, and they're going to start their little display. And I want to get up close to that fence, which would be as close as the public would be, and just to see what effect the, um, the rotor blades have. Colonel Hefford recruited the helicopters from the army at rather short notice to fill in time in the program of ceremonial high jinks for Independence Day. Relieved for a few moments from their normal duties, spotting rioting natives, they perform for Hefford a kind of aerial gavotte which he hopes will entertain the populace without scaring the daylights out of them. The public are going to be about this far away, are they? Yes, they will. Um, we're not doing it on this football ground, we're doing it on this sort of parade ground behind us. What, why, why aren't they doing it there now? Well, because as you can see, it isn't finished. They're still tarmacking the thing, so they can't do it there now. Just to make sure, the Colonel conducts his own version of a national opinion poll. All right. I think we've got our answer. Is he there? Ask him to come in then. I can't get through on this call. Yes, please. Yes, please. I'm going in a few minutes. Colonel Hefford's desk is the nerve centre of the entire operation, the place where he deals with supplicants and deflects pressure groups. In this case, a plea for a multi-denominational prayer. Mr. Mubadar, what is this? Uh, I phoned you uh, yesterday. Uh, about the... Um, uh, the uh, yes. yes, I know. I called on uh, Mr. Boenjebe mm -hmm. just now, and he told me to refer the matter to you. Yes. For well, now it's, it's too late now to fit it into the programme. I'm sorry about this. Even for a matter of uh, yes. one minute? I'm afraid it is. It's too late. Because you could provide for the microphone mm. and everything. Yes, I know you could. But the thing is this, that I did ask the Prime Minister as soon as I came here uh, whether he wanted prayers or not at the flag raising ceremony, and he definitely said no, he didn't. That's why I came uh, a bit uh, late. Mm. I called on them and I have had their signature. This would be a communique sent to the press, NBC and television. That's all right. Yeah, that's fine. It's the signature of 
Or yes. All right, but I'll put this to the Prime Minister, and if he agrees, uh, then we'll fit it in. All right, well now, would it be possible for you to get in touch with this canon and ask him to be on the Champ de Mars tomorrow afternoon at, I think it's 2.30, because we're having a rehearsal then for this display, and then we can tell him how to do it and when to do it. 2.30 tomorrow afternoon. 2.30 in the grandstand. Yes. You can come and see me. Uh, I expect he knows what I look like. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Well, I'll do my best. Goodbye. 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 Do you find there are uh, many local interests, many conflicting local interests like that? Oh, Which yes, you do. they always come in at the last minute. Um, oh, I had two letters yesterday, one from a Muslim association saying, please, will we decorate the square in their village? Um, well, if we did that, I spoke to the priest, naturally, and they said, no, not on your knife. Do they appreciate your problems? Um, oh, yes, I think so. Oh, the priest, very much so, yes. But then you see, um, if we did this, well then the Creole village two miles away would want to know why theirs wasn't done. And this might give cause for more trouble and more friction. And in any case, it's too late to do it now, with only two days to go. But you're having to act the diplomat as well as the organiser. Oh, you have to do this, yes, a lot of this comes in, uh, like this business of this prayer. Um, and usually in other countries they say a prayer before the flag raising, where they've only got perhaps two or three different religions. But here, with um, 20 or more different types of religion, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, and so on, uh, you can't have them all out one after the other, otherwise we'd go on for 45 minutes. And so the PM, very wisely, in my opinion, I think, said, no, we won't have any prayers at all. Now they've come, you see, at the last minute and want this thing. They've all agreed that one minute, one small prayer read by one man. So I shall ask the PM, and if you please. Why do they all leave it to the last minute? Well, I don't know, but uh, this is it. I don't think they can appreciate uh, how long it takes to organize something like this, and uh, particularly this flag raising ceremony, which has got to be done so that the flag is raised actually at noon. Uh, if one is lackadaisical about it and says, all right, five past, ten past, it doesn't matter, two hoops, then the whole thing becomes slack, like a balloon, but if it's got to be uh, at noon and you work to this and it's timed to this and it's rehearsed to this and then it keeps people on the key otherwise they tend to stack off. One of the hazards that the Colonel's carefully designed timetable has to cope with is the uncertain Mauritius climate. In between bursts of rain, the 2,000 school children attending the dress rehearsal pick their way over the soggy ground towards the tarmac where they will do their stuff. The idea is that half of them will form a vast ring in the approximate outline of the map of Mauritius, while the rest, dressed in the appropriate colours, line up in ranks to form the four bars of the national flag. The whole operation is dangerously prone to hitches, both natural and technical. Independence and human rights. And so it is that Mauritius has come to be a nation after patiently framing its own character and civilization for almost a century. A century of trial and error, of accumulated endeavor and wisdom, which has witnessed greater social justice mated to all. A century of changes and progress, where the workers themselves have inspired those changes which now grant to Mauritius its status of liberty and self-expression, whereby in this most composite of nations there will be, as before the law, no rich, no poor, no high, no low, no black, no white, but one country, one citizenship, equal rights and a common destiny for all. The Mauritius national anthem, Glory to the Motherland, is so new that nobody yet knows quite how it ought to go. While 2,000 children wait between rainstorms, the experts sort it out. One before last. Oh, yes. You see? Yeah, a little pause there, yeah. What do you do? 
pom 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 do 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 yes yeah. yeah. uh da 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 and evo Ils sont tellement occupés avec ces messieurs. <rire> Allez, ensemble, non, attendez, attendez, hein. Allez, attendez. Monsieur Lorenz, on peut avec l'accompagnement Allez, Clo, avec l'accompagnement. Écoutez, mais vous allez suivre ma baguette ici. Hein? Clo, attendez. Hein? Clo, attendez. The new anthem is a genuine local product conceived and published in Mauritius, the inspiration of the second drummer from the left in the rear rank of the Mauritius police band. What was it that inspired you to write that tune? How did you go about submitting it once you'd written it? Who did you put it uh, to? Well, one night when I was sick, and the other was sick. That was my inspiration. Night. And did you go to the bandmaster with it? Yes. And he accepted it straight away? Yes. How did you feel? Oh. <laughs> The telephone is ringing. I think it's Mr. Bailey. All right, we're going to switch him through. Now come here before you go. I've finished. All right, I've finished. Um, those are the, these are the ones that want red labels as well as notes. Yes. yes. Those three just the red labels. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, well, let's see. And the letter I have not sent it because uh, we should have received another letter from Mr. Rogers, say one for each person. So. Okay. Someone inviting me to go to a Muslim service. I haven't got time to go to any service. Have you had a lot of invitations of that kind when you've been here? Um, yes, quite a number. How are you going to get your own invitations off in time before this state banquet? It's now Wednesday. You only got till Monday. Oh, yes, that's easy enough because I should do the uh, seating plan tonight and the invitations tomorrow morning. And then they go out to the... Um, Put up into districts and they go to the police and the police distribute them through districts so they're delivered by policemen actually. Yes? Boy Scouts are one of the invariable features of a Colonel Hefford ceremony. Indirect descendants of the empire that created Baden Powell and a million wolf cubs before them, they march, almost in step, into a slightly uncertain future. Here at Les Jardins de Pamplemousse, or in English, Grapefruit Gardens, they're to be rehearsed in their one and only duty, opening and closing VIP's car doors. When, um, what we want is this. Um, the princess gets out of the car, yes. and Mr. Elgovy, yes. the governor and Lady Rennie, yes. and then the controller and the lady in waiting behind. Yes. What we don't want to happen is that national anthem to go as soon as the princess gets out, yes, wait, and leaves the lady in waiting standing on one leg in the car and one leg out. Yes, I see, sir. So you wait, I'll be here, and yep. I'll just give you a signal, and off you go. Yes, I'll be there. Yeah. That's right. Well, you watch me. Yes, sir. And I'll give you a signal, yes. and then the first six bars. First six bars, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Right around. Stop. Open the door. What are you waiting for? What do you mean? I'm Prime Minister. Hello, Princess. How are you? Hello, Mr. Ogilvy. How are you? Now, we just stand here for a second and we get the British National Anthem and everybody has gathered up. Yeah. 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 
Now then, that's it. Now set yourselves out for the departure when the cars are leaving. What did you think of that run, Colonel Hefford? Oh, that was better. More like it. Yes, more like it. You've got to be slick on a job like this. Yes. And then after that, I can start. Immediately. All your tooling. Yes. Yes. And then at the end, when the princess goes, it's the Mauritius. I'll give you the signal for that. Now, Benny, come on. Like Boy Scouts, fireworks are a must for a Colonel Hefford ceremony. The fireworks man from Hemel Hempstead has followed the Colonel to the various ends of the Empire, making sure that each fragment goes out with a bang rather than a whimper. The pièce de résistance, in 16 numbered pieces, looks like a series of long white worms crucified on a rose trellis. Only the expert can tell what it is. Well, this is the portrait of the Prime Minister. It's made up of 10 frames of uh, 5 by 10, which overall gives us a diameter of, you know, a length 25 by 20 feet. And uh, it probably lasts, say, a minute to minute to 10 seconds. And what, what is it made of? What are these well, actually, uh, white fuses? We call fuses? them it's, uh, white fuses. The it's white fuse is the most part of it, which just flashes around instantaneously. And the lance will actually burn just the one minute and 10 seconds. And what colour are they? When that they is burn? in bright. What we call in white. Bright? White. And the whole thing is in white? Yes, the whole thing is in white. Because portraits stand out better, much better in, uh, in bright. Have you had to do this sort of thing before? Yes, we've done, uh, well, I've been most independence countries. Uh, last one, British Guiana, 18 months ago. Uh, and what sort of thing did you do there? Similar, I mean, the Kenya and Uganda, those were slightly bigger, bigger countries that uh, they could afford to spend more money, I expect. Well, then what form does the total display take? Well, uh, the price, I, I mean, I'm not... Uh, the firm does deal with the price. But it's no, but what, what form does it take? What does it look like? Uh, well, here we've got the uh, portrait of the flag and the uh, coat of arms, as well as the primers, for the waterfall, rocket, shells and Romans. And also we've got the uh, mostly shells up uh, at the citadel. Unfortunately, we've had to spread it into two, you see. Well, what do you think it represents, fireworks, on an occasion like this? Do you think they're well, important? It's to, well, it's supposed to make people happy, I think something to finish the night off. I mean, you start off with something in the daytime and then at night, that's the, the finish of the fireworks scene to finish them like everything at home. You, it goes off with a bang and that's the finish of it. The various pieces are fitted together and hauled into place by a party of sweating sailors provided by the Royal Navy base HMS Mauritius. The fireworks man distrusts local talent. <laughs> right, now another five feet, chaps. All together, two, two on a rope. Get two together, so you get underneath the pole, Let's right? Have you come under Colonel Hefford in the organisation? Yes, oh yes, Colonel Hefford actually been around all the independents and uh, he's the one who, what was I say, by British, by Brox. He seems to, we've been, what, ten or a dozen. I think we've done nearly all the independents, really. And you've done them together with Colonel Hefford? With Colonel Hefford. I think, I think he missed out on uh, Ghana, where was uh, Captain Everard then. But from Ghana, he took over and he's done the lot. What do you think of him? Well, quite sociable. We don't have too much dealing. We don't like to bother him too much. We like to, you know, do our job, trouble him as least as possible. Once we get our equipment, car laid on, take us here. Good hotel, well, we're quite happy. Those informal moments when royal personages stop for a chat with proud but embarrassed schoolgirls are, in fact, among the most difficult events to rehearse. Once again, the ceremonial man demonstrates his versatility by showing the girls how to drop a curtsy without dropping flat. Don't bow your head. Look the princess in the face. Don't be shy. All right, try it again, please. Now, look, stand still. Come up in front of the princess. Stand still. Stand still. Get your feet together. Now put your right foot back. Sink. Hold your head up. Sink down. That's it. Now then. There we are. Dominique Lee, young thing. 
A little closer, a little closer, a little closer. That's perfect. That's nice. Lovely. Well How do you go about putting right the things that go wrong? Ah, oh, well, on the spot if I can, but afterwards at a conference, mainly. But usually on the spot, people get the idea. Are you moved at all by a sort of blind faith that everything will be all right on the day? I wouldn't be here unless I had that faith. <laughs> The martial sounds of independence accompany the martial presence of the Royal Guard of Honour, the best part of the Mauritius Special Force, or at least those that can be spared from quelling riots. The march-off ends the day's rehearsal. It only remains for Colonel Hefford to check the timings and gather all the commanders together to tell them where they went wrong and how to put it right. Guard of Honour, OK. 50 seconds, we're out of minute, that's fine. So you get him on that. And another thing, I don't want to be rude, can we smarten up smart their drill a little bit? The music's fine, but yeah. the drill one's fine. Yeah. Can you get a drill sound from Brown? You're changing mouth for it. Change it. Everything. All right. Change your mouth. All right. Well, there's only just a bit smart about a bit yeah. on that, please. Um, now, you only played, actually, the six and a half minutes. Yes. I didn't, I didn't make that. Uh, now, you're allowed eight. 11. Yes. You're allowed 11. But we, 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 all we got was six and a half. Can you play some more, more here? Yeah. Uh, many modes. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, now, do you think they could spread out down the well, arena? Turn that, spread them right out across yes, the arena, because there'll be a shambles and a head-on collision if you yes, go on like that. Yes, in the one the top third yeah. of the arena. I'll, I'll get them moved out, and also I'll get this business of all turning the same way, one yes. turn the other way. Yes, it is all time. right hand really had a head-on. Yeah. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. The racial mix-up of Creole, Indian and Chinese presents the ceremonial man with special problems of tact and diplomacy. As always, he finds a practical solution. Um, well, the Chinese one, um, in this national display, which precedes the flag-raising ceremony, I wanted um, all sections of the community to take part, uh, the Hindus, the Creoles um, and the Chinese. And it seemed to be all right at the start. Well, they were all going to take part. Well, then the riots occurred towards the end of January, and the Creole Sega dancers, as they call them, um, opted out and said on no account would they take part, because the Muslims and the Creoles had been fighting, remember. Um, we then tried to get another uh, band of Creoles who, to dance, and uh, they were, so we are told, bribed by the opposition party not to take part. And now we have a, a third band of Sega dancers. And at the last rehearsal, as you saw yourself, instead of about 30 or 40 turning up, just the five musicians turned up. But I'm told by the person who is producing them that the actual dancers will appear on the day. Well, this is a somewhat dicey, from my point of view as a producer of a show, 
to have something on for five or six minutes, which I've never even seen. And they've never attended a rehearsal. What about the Chinese? Well, we went to the um, Nationalist Chinese first. Uh, I mean, I didn't choose them. I simply asked local Mauritians to, to who should one go to. And they said, well, this is the chap. So we went to him. And I didn't know that he was Nationalist at that time. Anyway, um, as I was uh, saying, after the killings, they said they'd go on with it. And then two or three days later, they said, no, they couldn't anymore. And we explained that there was no danger. And uh, then it appeared that they'd heard, which, of course, they shouldn't have heard, that um, Red China had been asked to send a delegate here for the independence celebrations as the guest of the government. But Formosa had not. So that was really the reason why they'd opted out. So then uh, I said, well, for goodness sake, find me some Chinese who are pro something or other, who, who can, even if they're communists, I don't mind. So we can get uh, Chinese Mauritians taking part in the show. So the um, pro Peking group were approached and were only too delighted because they'd heard that the others had opted out. And um, these are the people whom you have seen on rehearsal. What still remains to be done? What have you still got to do before the flags are changed? Well, the bulk of our guests arrive tomorrow afternoon by air, about quarter past three. And um, we have still got to fill in their dispatch cases. Each guest gets a dispatch case with all his invitations in the literature and all the other bits and pieces which we give them. Uh, that'll all be finished tonight. And uh, there are one or two small uh, things outstanding. Two things have happened this afternoon. Um, we had ordered cigars from London through the Mauritius Commission. The Prime Minister had actually ordered them. And they should have been on the plane. Well, they're not on the plane, so it looks now as if we should have no cigars for the banquet. So I shall have to try and route around before Monday and today's Saturday evening, um, trying to get some cigars, and tomorrow's Sunday. Um, Again, I've been told this afternoon that the Mauritian car flags, which ministers are going to fly, I ordered um, 25, there are only 15 ministers, but anyway, 25 flags uh, from England, and uh, they came out with all the other flags, uh, with all the other nations are being invited in the new Mauritius flag. And uh, when the car flags were delivered up here to the office of one of my staff, instead of being 25, there were only 10. Well, I know the firm in England extremely well who make these things, and they haven't made a mistake. So in the um, storehouse where the flags were unpacked and stacked and whatnot, somebody has stolen 15, so we've five ministers now with, without a car flag, and there'll be a row, and I shall be bled. In fact, the colonel ensures that as little as possible is left to chance. The old army reflexes come into play, especially when confronted with dirty shoes on parade. Hmm? What shoes are you going to wear next week? These, these shoes, or have you got some more? Uh, these shoes, you've got some more. These. You got some boot polish. You got some boot polish, Benny? That was all right. Yeah. Don't forget, polish your shoes. You got some shoe polish? Polish your shoes, you know? You got some polish. Have you got any? Mm -hmm. Polish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You buy one. Well, can't you buy a tin for them all? What? Buy a tin for them all, then they won't have to pay for it out of their pocket money. Buy a tin. Well, if we're ready, we'll just practice this. Yes. We've got the bodies. Yes. Right, thank you. Morning. Good morning, Inspector. No independence ceremony is complete without a religious service. In Mauritius, this could be complicated because the majority of the population are Hindus, with substantial minorities of Muslims and Roman Catholics. But, British to the last, the island still has the established church. So it's to the Anglican Cathedral, normally deserted save for the clergy and a handful of conscientious civil service churchgoers, that the royal party must go. To greet them come all the clerics of all the denominations whose consciences are ecumenical enough to allow them to shake the royal hand. For the rehearsal, the royals are still stand-ins, the bishops real, and the colonel still in charge. Mr. Ogilvy is coming behind you, Bishop. Yes, yes. Now, look, shake right. hands with the Bishop first, please. Shake hands with the Bishop, please. That's it. Now, Bishop, if you would just walk across the Princess, but you want to do your presentations to the Dean and the others. Yes. That's it. Yes. Mr. Ogilvy, Archdeacon. Don't forget, Mr. Ogilvy. Mr. Robertson. Thank you. Minister of Church of Scotland. Yes. I'm trying to move that. Thank you very much.
Remember to shake hands with Mr. Ogilvy as well. <laughs> well. We'll just say, ma'am, would you mind standing here for a moment? Yes. Now then, could we form the procession then, Dean, please? Okay. Uh, Virgil, kneel down, please. Okay, go on. <laughs> While the Anglican clergy have their last field day, things spiritual are already giving way to things temporal, for the majority at least. Unfortunately, by no means everybody in Mauritius is in favour of independence, and as the day dawned, it became clear that nearly half the population were determined to boycott the whole thing. The rest, mostly Indians, wanted to celebrate. In one thing only was the entire population wholly united. All of them rejoiced in the fact that Her Royal Highness Princess Alexandra, true representative of the Queen of England, was going to do them the honour of presiding over their independence celebration. <laughs> But at the last minute, the British government, anxious to avoid the remotest possibility of another bit of bad publicity, at home that is, not abroad, decided not to send the royal couple. So the governor stood in for the Queen, and Colonel Hefford ensured that everything went ahead almost as planned. Instead of the princess, a former colonial secretary, Mr Anthony Greenwood, who, on his only previous visit to the island, had a stone chucked at his car by a bored bystander. Somewhere in the crowd, a disillusioned lady police sergeant and a policeman back on traffic duty tried to carry on as though nothing had happened. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a lovely morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This, after all, is an occasion for self-congratulation, for demonstrating a bit of independence as well as achieving it. And all nations, however peacefully they get their freedom, must remind themselves of the shackles of colonialism and convince themselves that winning their independence has all been a terrific struggle. Mauritius is no exception. The floats manned by third-generation Indian immigrants recall the fierce battles of the past, the heroic achievements of their country. The communist Chinese contingent, all sporting a little red cap in honour of Chairman Mao, put their dragon through its paces, happily joining their imperialist cousins in the last salute to the Union Jack.
The symbolic moment is over, but the swearing in of the ministers and the state opening of parliament and many other ceremonies still lie ahead. In a brief pause between official events, Colonel Hefford makes the journey back to the bungalow allotted to him. It's rent free, one of the very few perks he allows himself. In fact, he's paid only £350 a month, which isn't a lot when you consider that it's only for three months. And for those three months, he's been at the centre of every argument, the mediator in every quarrel, on duty 24 hours in every day. Only once did we see him appear to lose his temper, and that was at a reception when he took the Prime Minister's private secretary on one side and dressed him down. What had the poor man done to merit the Colonel's anger? Well, he was responsible for the organisation of that party and not me. I was then responsible for working with the police to get the guests there, the traffic arrangements and all the rest of it. And the actual business of the princess in the old days, arriving and being greeted and what she did and where she went. But the arrangement for food and drink for the guests and the invitations and all this was not my concern. <coughs> Although I, had, uh, I knew what was going on and what had been arranged. And when I found that guests, delegates from foreign countries had been there for over an hour and hadn't even had a drink at all, and in fact, um, there wasn't any drink for the Prime Minister or for the Governor General, because the private bar had been over raided by, or been raided by local people, and bottles had been whisked away, and they were guzzling in the bushes somewhere. Well, then, when I found the man responsible, I was a bit cross, naturally, because the Prime Minister kept saying to me, where are the drinks? Why can't I have a drink? And so I told him, you better go and explain to your own Prime Minister why he can't have a drink, not me. The last and perhaps the most important ceremonial event is the state opening of the new parliament with an independent government in office. The governor, now governor general, performs the opening ceremony in place of Princess Alexandra. For this occasion only, the ceremonial man dons ceremonial uniform and the full dress, tropical, of a colonel in the British army, rescued for a few hours from the mothballs. Colonel Hefford believes firmly that Britain is right to give up her colonial possessions, and he prefers to think of his own part in this as that of a midwife rather than a funeral director. He admits reluctantly to being rather a sensitive man, but if anything brings him sadness and a self-made profession of saying goodbye, he never lets it show, not even when making his last formal farewell to the first Hindu Boy Scouts. Thank you very much indeed for all you've done. Goodbye now. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. The Prime Minister's profile, outlined in bright because it shows up better, duly appears at midnight in Grapefruit Gardens. 150 years of colonial rule and three months of Colonel Hefford's go up like Guy Fawkes in a blaze of coloured lights. Home for Eric Hefford is a rented mock Tudor house in the commuter countryside near Guildford. It's here that he rests between independent ceremonies and looks after his widowed mother and 14-year-old son. It's a life he knows can't last. 
After eight years and eight different countries, the pattern has become all too familiar. When it's all over, the ceremonial man is redundant. Uh, yes, completely. Um, that's why I leave always fairly quickly, within a week or ten days afterwards. It just gives me sufficient time to um, write thank you letters for prime ministers to sign and thank you letters of my own to the people who've helped and to set the ball in motion for clearing up and tidying up what do we do with the decorations and what do we do with the flags and when should we take them down and getting the sort of starting the bills start to come in and then I leave before the bills are paid. What other kinds of jobs can you imagine yourself doing? I really don't know. Um, this is what I want somebody else to tell me. Somebody with an objective view of um, what we say my capabilities are now. Um, I really don't know. It'd be very difficult to say. Um, the last thing I want to do is to sit behind a desk. Uh, I like being outside. I like moving about. I like travelling. I like meeting people. Um, uh, beyond that, I, I really don't know. What most appeals to you, though? What, what, what kind of job would you would you like to do in the best of all possible worlds? Well, that's impossible to say now, having spent a quarter of a century as a soldier. Um, uh, this independent celebrations um, was only a short-term thing anyway. I knew this when I, when I started it. And it's gone on, in fact, um, rather longer than I thought it would. Um, but I may be of use somewhere, to somebody, at some time. <laughs>